Welcome, everybody. I'm going to talk about the ways in which NSAIDs, steroids, and blood thinners may or may not negatively affect the platelets and the PRP we are creating. Hopefully, we can all leave the discussion with a more nuanced approach toward our discussions with patients. I have no pertinent conflicts of interest. These are my conclusions and do not represent any sort of position statement. I'd like to thank Mary Ambach for asking me to present and for assisting me with the technical aspects of tonight's talk. This was me over the weekend. Sources I used to develop this program included peer-reviewed guidelines from ASRA and ASIP, peer-reviewed medical literature, websites from multiple academic centers, and my totally non-scientific LinkedIn polls. In terms of what we do in our own practices, in many cases there is consensus, and in others there's quite a bit of dogma and variability in terms of what we tell our patients. So why is this topic important? These are the three basic principles I focused on. Basic platelet function, patient safety, and optimization of the healing environment. So let's focus on some basic science. During the normal clotting process, inactive platelets are exposed to substances like fibrinogen, collagen, and von Willebrand factor. These activate platelets. Multiple intracellular signaling reactions then occur, resulting in expression of glycoprotein receptors GP2B and 3A on the platelet surface. Activated platelets deform and release various local mediators such as ADP, thromboxane A2, and thrombin, which further amplify the platelet activation and recruitment. This results in platelet aggregation via cross-linking fibrinogen molecules with the glycoprotein 2B3A receptors. This is called primary hemostasis, and this also results in platelet degranulation, which is what we're interested in with the release of growth factors from alpha and dense granules. Here's another depiction of platelet aggregation showing cross-linking of activated platelets by fibrin. So in this picture, our platelets have been stimulated. They've now aggregated and they've also begun to crenellate or deform. And the next step is of course, the release of the bioactive factors contained in platelets, including growth factors, chemotactic and angiogenic factors, and cytokines. These are some of the receptor sites and activation factors that allow for platelet activation. Von Willebrand factor, ADP, thromboxane, fibrinogen, and glycoprotein 2B3A. So where do NSAIDs, steroids, and blood thinners exert their effects on platelets? We know that especially with non-selective NSAIDs, there's inhibition of the formation of thromboxane A2. And ADP receptor inhibitors such as Plavix and Tyclid prevent platelet aggregation by selectively and irreversibly binding the ADP receptor P2Y12. In patients taking ADP receptor inhibitors, platelet aggregation is inhibited for the remainder of the platelet lifespan, or 7 to 10 days. This is a great illustration showing that there are at least 11 sites that come into play with regard to platelet activation, aggregation, and degranulation. We'll come back to this picture. So let's talk about NSAIDs first. Both non-selective and COX-2 specific NSAIDs block the cyclooxygenase pathways, resulting in decreased prostaglandin synthesis. But in terms of our interests, there are some very important differences between the drugs which come into play. As a reminder, here are the half-lives and mechanisms of action of the anti-inflammatory drugs. Like Plavix, aspirin irreversibly inhibits COX-1, leading to the inhibition of platelet aggregation, which is why it's used for its blood thinning and cardioprotective effects. Over-the-counter NSAIDs are non-selective inhibitors of both COX-1 and COX-2. We use a lot of Toradol in our office, which is a short-acting selective COX-1 inhibitor. Celebrex is the only selective COX-2 inhibitor available in the U.S., and Mobic is also relatively COX-2 selective. Selective COX-2 inhibitors were developed to reduce the risk of peptic ulcers and to reduce the risk of NSAID-associated bleeding since they don't inhibit COX-1. They're no better for pain than non-selective NSAIDs, and compared to the non-selective NSAIDs, they may put patients at risk, increased risk for cardiac events. As we'll see, COX-2 drugs may not have the same effect on platelets and PRP that we see with the non-selective NSAIDs, making their effect on PRP therapy less clear. 
all right, how about steroids? How do they work? So top left, glucocorticoids first bind to a protein receptor on the cell membrane. The steroid molecule is then transported into the cytoplasm where it binds to and activates the glucocorticoid receptor. The activated glucocorticoid receptor then enters the cell nucleus where it causes upregulation of genes coding for lipocortin, which blocks production of phospholipase A2 and therefore arachidonic acid. And it also causes downregulation of COX-2 production, the net effect being a profound reduction in inflammation. Here's another depiction of how the activated glucocorticoid receptor can have profound effects on the production of inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1 and TNF-alpha, as well as other cytokines involved in the immune response such as IL-2. And finally, blood thinners. The most popular blood thinners include Xarelto and Eliquis, which are known as direct acting oral anticoagulants or DOACs. These are typically preferred because they have an antidote available. DOACs work via the common pathway in one of two ways, either by preventing the conversion of prothrombin, otherwise known as factor two, into thrombin, otherwise known as factor 2A, or in the case of Pradaxa, by reversibly binding to the active site on the thrombin molecule. So with all three of these drugs, the end result is that thrombin is not available. If thrombin is not available, fibrinogen can't be converted into fibrin, and cross-linking of fibrin will not occur, preventing the formation of blood clots. Here is a summary list of all the different anticoagulants with their mechanisms of action. I'm really not going to talk about the TPA and selective thrombin inhibitors since these are typically used in the hospital setting for acute vascular and cardiac situations. Really not a good time for a PRP procedure. In terms of discontinuation times, we will talk about these later on in the presentation. But remember, we're not talking about clotting. We're talking about PRP. So what do we do with all this information? This is supposed to be a platelet trying to survive NSAID exposure, but AI made him look more like Mr. Kool-Aid. So there's plenty of data out there on the effects of NSAIDs on coagulation and platelet function, but is there anything specific about NSAIDs and PRP? Here's an old review which goes over the basics of how NSAIDs affect platelet aggregation. It also discusses how other factors may come into play in terms of the clinical effects of NSAIDs on platelet function and bleeding. Take a look at the collagen-mediated aggregation graphs, third column from the left, circled in green, showing collagen-mediated aggregation. Remember that. Schaefer concluded that non-selective NSAIDs affect platelet aggregation in a time dose and half-life dependent fashion and their clinical effects are enhanced by the concomitant use of alcohol, anticoagulants, and underlying disease. Another oldie but goodie discussing how relatively COX-2 selective NSAIDs may have less of an inhibitory response on COX-1 independent platelet aggregation. FYI, COX-1 independent platelet aggregation is just another way of saying collagen mediated aggregation. Remember those graphs in the last slide. So maybe there's something different about these COX-2 specific drugs. These guys didn't study Celebrex, which was only two years old at the time. Here's the first PRP specific paper I could find. This is a 2020 review looking at the effects of antiplatelet drugs and NSAIDs on PRP. 15 studies met the author's criteria and they found that in patients taking NSAIDs, activation with collagen, ADP, and arachidonic acid was most significantly and negatively affected. On the other hand, if PRP was activated with uh, thrombin or calcium chloride, growth factor release was not significantly affected, even in patients on NSAIDs. Scott Rodeo dug in a little further in 2021, finding no effect of antiplatelet drugs on PRP in 12 papers meeting his criteria. Antiplatelet drugs studied included diclofenac, meloxicam, and aspirin. They proposed that the in vivo requirements for thrombus formation may be different from those required for tissue regeneration. He also suggested that the multiple excitatory signals found in musculoskeletal tissue may be a strong enough activation signal to overcome any inhibitory effects of antiplatelet therapies used by patients. So this slide from earlier kind of sums up Rodeo's conclusions. There are many different ways that platelets can be activated. NSAIDs are going to affect some of them, but not all of them.
Cal's group did a similar systematic review with 20 studies qualifying. They found that aspirin, Tylenol, and statins, as well as NSAIDs, did not decrease platelet counts. Non-selective NSAIDs did impair platelet aggregation, however. COX-2 selective NSAIDs did not. They concluded that selective COX-2 NSAIDs do not need to be withheld prior to PRP injections. Gupta and his group also concluded that non-selective NSAIDs do not decrease platelet count, but do decrease platelet aggregation. Platelets taking naproxen had decreased PDGF and IL-6 levels. COX-2 specific drugs had no effect on platelet aggregation or growth factor release from PRP. How about low-dose aspirin? Patients taking low-dose aspirin did show decreased growth factor levels in PRP. These authors point out that PRP from, taking, uh, from patients taking NSAIDs will be arachidonic acid deficient and therefore non-responsive to arachidonic acid stimulation. Interestingly, they neglect to comment on the fact that three out of the four other pathways for platelet aggregation appear to be fully active and completely intact in patients taking NSAIDs. So remember, the non-arachidonic pathways that these guys studied included ADP, collagen, and thrombin receptor activated peptide 6, or TRAP6. So being a glass half full kind of guy, I kind of look at this and say, hmm, three out of four smiley faces ain't too bad. This group from Turkey found that in vitro serum levels of PDGF and VEGF did not change in PRP exposed to Voltaren, Mobic, and aspirin. And finally, from the platelet storage world, Driver points out that the addition of even a small amount, as low as 10% by volume of normal platelets, which have not been exposed to aspirin or other NSAIDs, is enough to restore normal aggregation response to ADP and arachidonic acid. So if a patient comes in for a PRP procedure and they tell you, listen, doc, I forgot and I took one dose of ibuprofen 800 milligrams yesterday, do you really need to cancel their procedure? In other words, despite your patient's best efforts to thwart success, maybe there are still enough normal platelets circulating to counteract your patient's crime. What are they doing in the ivory towers? This data was pulled from the internet looking at seven different universities in no specific order or with any bias. So 50% hold NSAIDs for seven days prior, 25% hold two weeks prior and 25% provide patient specific recommendations. Afterwards, 37.5% hold for seven days, 25% hold for two weeks, and one group holds NSAIDs for six weeks. 25 and 37.5% say Tylenol is okay before and after PRP respectively. So what did you guys say? A lot of nuance here, but overall 82% of responders said one to two weeks prior and after a procedure. Other comments were allowed in the poll and they are included in that cloud on the right. Okay, steroids, this should be pretty quick, right? I mean, steroids are bad. They're gonna have a negative impact on the healing cascade and you gotta be off them for six weeks before and after, right? Well, not so fast. Okay, so this follows with what we all know. Local anesthetics and steroids are bad for MSK tissue and adding them to PRP may negatively impact your outcomes. The following year, Beitzel published this study, again, mostly keeping in line with current thinking, PRP from eight subjects, tendon cells from the long head of the biceps, exposure to either methylprednisolone alone or methylprednisolone in combination with PRP. Both of these groups fared poorly when compared with PRP and even Ketorolac, surprisingly. However, the combination of methylprednisolone and PRP was less bad, if you will, than methylprednisolone alone in terms of cell viability. The purpose of this study was to investigate whether triamcinolone has negative effects on human rotator cuff cells and whether or not PRP can protect these cells from the effects of triamcinolone. Turns out it does have a negative effect, but the author suggested that PRP can be used as a protective agent in patients receiving triamcinolone injections. Joe and colleagues looked at rotator cuff tendons exposed to IL-1 beta uh, to induce tendinopathy. Tendinopathic tissue was then exposed to varying concentrations of PRP with or without dexamethasone. 
they found that PRP had cytoprotective effects on tenocytes, did not interfere with anti-inflammatory properties of dexamethasone, reversed the negative effects of dexamethasone and IL-1 beta on tenocytes, and had a beneficial effect on the ratio of collagen types 1 and 3 in tendons. In 2018, Comercruz Group challenged dogma suggesting that NEOA patients receiving one intraarticular uh, dose of methylprednisolone one week prior to PRP injections had significantly better clinical outcomes at three and six months compared to PRP or methylprednisolone injections alone. So at 12 months, no difference, but maybe some small advantages at three and six months. Who knew? So no harm in terms of clinical outcomes by using steroids and maybe some small advantages at three and six months. And here's another group from Turkey whose theory was that patients could both feel better quickly from low-dose triamcinolone and get long-lasting relief from PRP. And they also expressed their opinion that long-term cartilage damage from corticosteroids was a non-factor in this study because these patients already had advanced osteoarthritis. They did not study PRP alone, but concluded multiple injections are more effective than a single injection when using combined low-dose triamcinolone and PRP in advanced OA. So coming back to this chart, what do they do at PRPU? None of them comment on steroids before or after PRP. What do you folks do? 87% of responders ask their patients to stop steroids four to six weeks prior to a PRP procedure, and someone out there is even stricter three months before and after a PRP procedure. It's like getting a hip replacement. Man, that's tough. Okay, stick with me. We're getting to the end, but this is an important topic. As an anesthesiologist, I've been thinking about the role of blood thinners in interventional pain since 1993, and to this day, I haven't made up my mind about how to manage blood thinners and spinal procedures. So let's see what the literature says. The first major recommendations were published in ANA in 1994, and these were further clarified by ASRA and then by a consortium of groups culminating in this set of guidelines published in uh, 2018 by ASRA and ASIP. One of the key recommendations in the 2018 guidelines was that there should be a shared decision-making process between the physician performing these procedures and the patient's care team. The guidelines look specifically at the risk of serious bleeding that can occur in patients taking blood thinners who then get medical interventions. Procedures are grouped into low, intermediate, and high risk. And as you can see, for the vast majority of physicians doing PRP procedures outside the spinal canal, injections fall into the low risk of serious bleeding category, calling into question the concept that blood thinners need to be stopped summarily in patients receiving PRP in locations outside the spine. So these uh, guidelines are simple, right? Just look up your procedure, look up your anticoagulant, follow the recommendations, everything's going to be okay, right? Except what can happen when we stop these blood thinners? What are the risks associated with stopping blood thinners in our patients? Bogduk asked that question in 2016 and found some not so good outcomes. He found that even with intermediate risk transforaminal epidural steroid injections, the risk of spinal epidural hematoma may be lower than the risk of other really bad things like stroke, heart attack, and death. These are the things that can happen when some patients discontinue their blood thinners, and I've seen it in my own practice. Furman challenged the dogma slash consensus even further in 2023. This is a retrospective case series of all patients in a private practice receiving either interlaminar or transforaminal cervical or thoracic epidural steroid injections between 2009 and 2017. That's 592 cases over eight years. There was one patient who dropped out. They found no cases of spinal epidural hematoma in any patient, even in, the, even in those continuing blood thinners up to and during the time of spinal injection. And in their conclusion, they come back to the concept of a shared decision-making process based on individualized patient risk. So what about efficacy? Is there a decline in the potency of PRP if we continue antiplatelet drugs? 
We've already seen Fry's article showing that there is no difference in calcium chloride or thrombin-mediated activation of PRP in patients taking things like Coumadin, Ticlid, Plavix, and aspirin. So if you're treating a knee and your patient is taking Eliquis and she's at a high risk for stroke, maybe just think about leaving her on the Eliquis and activating that PRP with calcium chloride. Anna Tua's paper referenced in this article suggests that if you do this, you can expect normal platelet activation, fibroblast proliferation, and growth factor content, including HGF, PDGF, TGF-beta, and VEGF. And although these titles look ominous, they're really only looking at the effects of different anticoagulants used in the preparation of PRP. In the chapter on blood thinners and anticoagulants in Monchiconti's first edition, Essentials of Regenerative Medicine, the authors mostly focus on the bleeding risk factors and suggest a multi-tiered risk factor analysis, noting a paucity of data in the medical literature. And although this article was recently discussed on LinkedIn, I must respectfully disagree with their concluding statement since it does not take into account perhaps the most important factor we should be talking about when considering discontinuation of antithrombotics or anticoagulants, and that is patient safety. This paper does consider some of the very important aspects of platelet function, but it does not go into depth regarding the multiple ways in which platelets can be activated within the human body, as we've clearly seen. And in terms of the risks associated with blood thinner discontinuation, the author's discussion is, my opinion, unbalanced, neglecting to focus on the potentially catastrophic ways that we can impact our patients' lives when we ask them to stop blood thinners. I hope I've demonstrated that a more nuanced approach is called for. Our decisions to continue or hold medications should be based on our patient's health status, indications for antithrombotics, the overall procedure risks, and with whatever limited evidence we have, whether or not these drugs will have any clinically meaningful effect on the outcome of our therapies. It seems that most respondents in this final poll are thinking pretty conservatively with only 30% supporting the routine discontinuation of blood thinners before PRP procedures. So that's my presentation. Thank you to those of you who stayed awake. Here are some references for all you nerds. Here and here. Please feel free to ask questions or reach out to me by email or on LinkedIn. Mary, I will let you open it up to any comments or questions. And thanks again.